Sweet. Yeah. Great. Uh, great intro. So, um, yeah, it was, it was pretty, um, you know, fairly brutal week of, of price action again. Um, so I think there's a lot to discuss in the newsletter. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to touch on every single detail. I think um, it's important that people go and read the newsletter. And obviously, if you want the visuals, uh, you can go there as well. So I started off the newsletter kind of talking about what I thought to be was the most popular news story or the most talked about news story this week, which was uh, uranium prices. And that kind of followed the most popular story of earlier this week into last week, which was uh, European energy costs, um, which is uh, the benchmark to measure European energy costs is German year ahead base load power. Um, so last week, obviously, it was you know ripping up, up a lot. Um, and this week, we, we saw it kind of uh, cutting back down. It dropped 44 percent. Um, I think a lot of that could have to do with, you know, just speculation and all the and all the speculators that were in there uh, late last week. Um, but that kind of led to people saying, what are the alternatives if our energy costs are going to be up, you know, hundreds of percentage points uh, in a year? What are the alternatives? Um, and I think nuclear energy uh, is a pretty popular uh, second choice. So that's kind of why we saw this uh, relative outperformance of, of uranium uh, this week. So, you know, moving on from there, uh, I just wanted to touch on that. I'm not a, you know, commodities expert uh, by any means. I just think that's something that's relatively important to note. Um, so Wednesday was the last day of August. So I think it's, you know, fun to look at monthly data. So if you look at, actually, I posted this chart on my Twitter a little bit ago. So if you go on my page, it's my most recent tweet. Um, but I created this chart in Excel that shows the S&P's average monthly returns from 1900 to 2021, and then compared that or overlaid that with 2022's returns. So I think there's you know a few things that are of note on that chart. I think likely the first thing you'll notice is is what this this mean deviation of this year's returns, or like in other words, the volatility of this year's returns. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Obviously, um, if you're looking at one year's as, a, as your sample size in comparison to a 121 year average, you're going to have more volatility, right? That's a given. Um, also, there's the fact that we're in a bear market. So bear markets are more volatile than bull markets. Um, and over time, the S&P has risen, right? Over 120 years, it, it's risen. So there's going to be less volatility um, in those bull cycles in comparison to a you know, one year bear cycle. Um, but that's not really the point I was trying to make. What I really wanted to emphasize was this idea of seasonality in stocks. So seasonality refers to this idea that certain times of year are better for stocks than other times of year. And what I really wanted to highlight is the fact that September is historically the worst month of the year uh, for stocks. So it, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a terrible month. Um, and it, it doesn't mean that the S&P is going to be down. It doesn't mean that we're going to have the worst month of the year. Um, I think looking at historical price action in order to predict the future is not necessarily the way to frame it. I just think it's important for investors to keep in mind that historically speaking, September has been weak, right? It doesn't mean that September is going to be a terrible month. It just means that historically that's been the case. Um, moving on from there, I go into QQQ or the NASDAQ ETF. Um, just a little bit of technical analysis there. Um, on Tuesday, which I think is you know the most important day of the week, um, this week or maybe yesterday, but Tuesday was an important day because um, we, we undercut the 50 day simple moving average. So I refer to the 50 day as the guardrail. Um, there's a saying that says nothing good happens under the 50 day, but the 50 day is a super important moving average. It's used by a ton of institutions, a ton of retail investors. There's a ton of eyes on it. So it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy um, that's super important to keep an eye on. So on Tuesday, we, we cleanly broke below it um, on almost 50 day average volume. So it was a fairly significant break. And that was kind of the signal that, uh, you know, sellers are proliferant and buyers were extremely weak, which obviously is not a great sign if you're a bull. Um, and then yesterday, we we attempted to undercut this um, key support resistance level. So later on in the newsletter, um, a little bit down, I show this uh, support and resistance level that dates back to 2020, 2021. Um, and it's also used in 2022 just to kind of provide the framework or the background. Um, but that level aligned at around 297 on QQQ, um, which also aligned with this uh, anchored VWAP. So anchored volume weighted average price anchored from the June 16th lows. So that's showing us since we bottomed on June 16th of the average person that purchased QQQ, what's their cost basis? So those two levels aligned at, at, at around 297.30. 
So that was a super key level that I was personally watching um, that I would like to see defended. And that's exactly what we saw yesterday, which was a, a pretty good sign, you know, at least for the short term, because we, we were you know, extremely oversold. Uh, we were something like 5% under the 21 day. We were due for a bounce. I thought that was potentially a great place to do it. And, and that's what we've seen, at least you know, so far today. Obviously, I don't know if this is going to you know, lead to a new you know, um, high for you know, overpassing the, the, the August high. I have no idea if this is just a you know, one to two day bounce before heading lower. I don't know. Um, but I do think it's you know, fairly significant. I think we're due for a little bit of a short covering you know, relief rally. Um, and so far, that, that seems to be what we're getting. <clears throat> um, moving on from there, I was talking a little bit about market sentiment. So the way I'm measuring that is by looking at uh, CBOE's equity-only put-call ratio. So if you're unaware of what that is, it's, it's looking at the number of long puts in comparison to the number of long calls, or in other words, the number of bearish bets versus the number of bullish bets on the derivative market. Um, so a high put-call ratio or something above 1.0 would tell us that investors are overwhelmingly bearish. Um, and generally speaking, the market almost never does what the masses are expecting, right? So um, when the market is super pessimistic uh, in aggregate, it generally means that we're due for some sort of relief rally. Um, and as of yesterday, the put call was sitting at about 1.1, uh, which would indicate that the market is fairly bearish uh, and due for a rally. Um, but I also mentioned that you know sentiment can always go from bad to worse. So looking at the chart that's included in the newsletter, the put call ratio has been higher in 2022, it was higher in June and July. Um, which means that if the market the market has room to grow more bearish, of course, um, and if they do, there would there would be a lot more downside um, to come in the market. Um, moving on from there, I talked about the Dixie or the U.S. dollar currency index, which yesterday broke out of this short uh, sideways consolidation zone to make a 20 year high. So as of yesterday, it was at the highest it had been since 2002. Today, it's backtracking a little bit and is you know back below those levels. Um, but I, you know, when I wrote this yesterday, I, and I still do think it's, it's, it's important to note. Um, so I've discussed, you know, what the Dixie's effect is on other markets in this newsletter many times. Um, I think, you know, essentially speaking or generally speaking, um, the U S dollar is the global unit of account. So when you see that, that value appreciating, um, it tends to have negative effects on, on financial markets. So you have exporters are getting squeezed. Um, and the U.S. government's trade deficit is increasing in value. So, um, you know, it, it isn't too much of a shock to hear that, generally speaking, when the Dixie is climbing, it places sell pressure on equities and fixed income instruments. Um, and that's pretty much what we saw yesterday, at least from a uh, Treasury perspective. So I included a chart of the U.S. 10-year yield in the newsletter this week as well. Um, and yesterday, yields were climbing. Um, they, they've had a pretty you know, strong week for yields or weak weak week for bonds, uh, for treasury bonds. Um, so, and I also explained just a little bit about, you know, why um, rising yields is bad for equities. But generally speaking, what we've seen over the course of 2022 is that the bond market has been a leading indicator for what's to come in the stock market. Um, and, and a lot of people like to call the bond market, you know, the smart money. Um, and in 2022, they've generally been right. So when we're seeing these rising yields um, and the, you know, stock indexes are starting to bounce alongside them, um, if yields are going to continue to rise, it would signal to me that likely the stock market is going to reverse course and follow the bond market's lead. Um, but, you know, this relationship isn't one to one, meaning that it takes time for, um, you know, the moves in treasuries to spill over into equities. Um, I just think um, it's something to keep an eye on. Um, but moving on from there, I talked a little bit about uh, initial jobless claims. Um, nothing too major of an update there. We, we've, you know, we've had the third straight week of declining unemployment, um, which is obviously a great sign. Um, there was a report by uh, Reuters this week that says that um, layoffs by U.S. firms dropped by 21 percent in the month of August, which is also, you know, obviously not a bad sign. Um, but, you know, I do think it is worth noting that employment in, in the labor market is lagging behind uh, financial markets. So um, in in, in including interest rates and, and things like that, it, it's a lagging indicator. So it takes time for, you know, things in the economy and the financial markets to spill over into employment. So just because unemployment is falling doesn't necessarily mean that we're out of the water. It could potentially just mean that the labor market hasn't caught up yet. Um, I also talked a little bit about um, the National Financial Conditions Index, which is provided by the Chicago Fed. Um, 
long story short, it's basically saying that what the Fed is doing right now by raising interest rates to attempt to tighten monetary conditions is not working. Um, but there's a little, I wrote a little bit more about that in there. So I would highly recommend going to check that out. Um, of course, as always, I have the crypto exposed equity section in there as well. Um, I touched a little bit on, um, you know, the lawsuit against Michael Saylor and MicroStrategies. Obviously, we don't have any insights into that matter, um, but I do think it's, you know, something worth noting and, and keeping an eye on. I also explained some of the characteristics that I'm looking at um, for crypto exposed equities that are showing higher levels of strength in comparison to the rest of the pack. Um, but, you know, as I explained in the newsletter, these stocks are extremely beaten down um, and definitely not out of the water by any means. So I don't necessarily think they're in a great place for trading in my personal opinion, but I think they're in a great place if you're dollar cost averaging, if you're a long-term investor. Um, and then of course there's a Excel sheet that I always put in there that compares, you know, the weekly performance of a bunch of stocks. And then I go into Bitcoin technical analysis, um, which there isn't honestly a ton to say. We've essentially just had a sideways week, um, which to me looks like we're building out another you know, shorter term bear flag um, that would more likely than not result in a move to the downside. Um, but of course, you know, we don't have the you know, magic crystal ball. Um, can't predict the future, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that's that about sums it up for what I wrote about. Nice, the- Blake. Yeah, that was, that was great, Blake. Um, on the yeah. micro strategy stuff, I think it's uh, it's like pretty telling because Taylor always says, you know, he's like, don't don't buy micro strategy stock, like buy Bitcoin. That's the only thing I can I can morally and ethically tell you to buy. So like, regardless of what happens, I just I think it's kind of eerie that he sort of foreshadowed in a sense that like Bitcoin's the only risk free thing you could buy. Like, no Bitcoin derivatives always have have a layer of risk, and micro strategy is is a Bitcoin derivative, so. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I hope I hope Michael Saylor is obviously like not in any any huge trouble because I like I like hearing him talk about Bitcoin. He's a great figure, but you know, there's there's no heroes in this space, so anybody can can go down. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's super interesting. I don't like I said, you know, who who knows? Is he evading taxes? Is he not evading taxes? Who knows? Um, maybe the you know DC's attorney general knows. Maybe Michael Saylor knows, um, but. Yeah, I, was, I just thought it was pretty interesting. Um, it was pretty uh, surprising, I would say. But, um, you know, the market obviously didn't like it. MicroStrategy stock was down like 4% that day, whenever that was Wednesday or so. Um, but, yeah, I thought it was pretty crazy. Did you see where the uh, the ECB said that they're going to do yield curve control in the future? Yeah, I, I, I honestly like don't have a ton of insight in there. I think there's you know a lot of funky things going on. I saw... Um, you know, the G7's talking about, you know, price controls on, on Russian gas and, and all these things going on. Um, I just, you know, I don't necessarily have a ton of insight to give, you know, on here right now. But um, it's certainly interesting and, and something to, to keep an eye on. Yeah, Blake, I think you made a lot of really fantastic points. I'm curious to get your thoughts on the idea of the Fed potentially being, being able to do like a quote unquote soft landing. Like, is there a scenario and like what what do you think the is there a good probability that this happens that inflation just continues to, to come down, Fed funds, you know, finds a resting point over the next few months, and then equities and, and even Bitcoin just kind of makes a slow grind higher, it's kind of sideways, but also kind of higher. What are your thoughts on a quote unquote soft landing? Yeah, I mean I think theoretically it's possible. Um, but in reality it's it's not easy to do. That's, that's really hard to do, of course. Um, and so I talk about it a little bit in the newsletter, just that the, the financial, um, conditions index from the Chicago fed. Um, and that's showing us that what the federal reserve has been doing over the course of 2022 in order to tighten financial conditions, um, and hopefully create a soft landing is not working. So financial conditions are loosening, um, over the course of the last few months, uh, which tells us that, most likely in the future, the Fed is going to potentially have to become more aggressive, um, which you know is, is super interesting to me. And that kind of decreases the chance of them being able to put in a soft landing. Um, you know, in my opinion, I think it's I would say, you know, it's, it's fairly unlikely. I don't but it's hard to say because I I'm not totally sure that we're going to have, you know, this this super nasty hard landing and there's going to be bank runs and insolvency and all these things. It's certainly possible. Um and the Fed's kind of in this 
awkward position where, you know, they're saying we want to, we're going to keep raising interest rates. We're going to hold interest rates elevated for a long period of time, um, which obviously could have extremely drastic effects on the U.S. economy, which is the most indebted that it's been in its history, right? That GDP is something like 130 um, percent. So it's kind of this you know, precarious position that the Fed's been put in where it's extremely hard to do a soft landing. But if there was a hard landing, it would be, um, you know, potentially one of the worst things we've seen uh, this century. Um, so, you know, I obviously I, I won't you know speculate too much on is there going to be a soft landing? Is there going to be a hard landing? I think it's certainly possible that you get a soft landing, um, but it's significantly harder to do that, right, than it is to just have a hard landing, if that makes any sense. Should I we, wonder uh, how, how things would be right now if they didn't do the, the monetary expansion when COVID happened. If they would have just, you know, because people stop working, so obviously there's going to be a decrease in productivity. The economy is going to go into a slight recession. But I wonder if if they would have just let it happen in 2020 and not do the massive QE, how things would be and, and if we would be in better shape now versus doing the QE and now they, we've got so much inflation, they have to undo it. It's just inflation, deflation, and it's just not good. The, these cycles are destructive. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a interesting thought experiment obviously who knows what would have happened i think you know powell was put in a weird position where we had this pandemic and everyone's terrified no one knows it's going to be bad like people thought you know maybe this is the the black plague and and half the world's going to die you had no idea right people were so scared no one knew anything um so i think you know going into quantitative easing and lowering interest rates to zero um isn't necessarily the worst idea just because you you think potentially this could you know absolutely destroy the economy obviously that wasn't exactly the case i think the biggest uh flaw or the biggest mistake was the fact that you kept quantitative easing going all the way through 2020 all the way through 2021 um and ended it um you know in early 2022 i think that was the biggest mistake and one of the reasons one of the bigger reasons why um, inflation is such an issue now, because that is expanding the monetary base. I think this is a a good point to segue into Bitcoin because we don't have those problems. There's not, there's not someone controlling the supply of the currency to, to do what they, they deem as, is the politically right thing to do. Or, you know, there's no, you can't centrally plan an economy and the Federal Reserve, in a sense, centrally plans the money and that bleeds into everything. But thankfully, we have Bitcoin and I'll get started on the on-chain stuff. Let me pin my thread to the uh, to the nest up there so you guys can see what I'm talking about. There we go. It should be up now. So uh, first on the on-chain stuff is the, the cost basis. So that's. Also, you might hear it referred to as realized price. The short-term holder realized price and long-term holder realized price are about to cross. They're $2,000 away from each other. So the short-term holder realized price is at 25 k and the long-term holder is at 23 k And every time they've crossed, it's only happened like during the bottom of bear markets. So, you know, on-chain, I wouldn't trade day-to-day off of it, off of it but it provides a great just long-term perspective of where we are in the bitcoin cycle and it, it looks like we we are likely near the bottom there's there's no telling how long the bottom could last we could crab in this 20k range for like a year especially with the, the way macro is shaking out but if if the history tells us anything like this it, bitcoin shouldn't go too much lower based off of off of this metric and a couple other valuation metrics you know the one being the mayor multiple which basically measures the the range between Bitcoin's price and the 200-day moving average. And Bitcoin, at this point, the mayor multiple at, at 0.65, it's about as low as it's ever been below the 200-day moving average. Um, the only other time it, it got this low was in 2012. So that's that's another sign that Bitcoin's just an extreme value. If if you dollar cost average, which is what I'd personally do, like this is a good time to, to increase the size of your DCA if you can afford to and start going heavier also the Puel multiple is back back in the value zone that basically measures where bitcoin's at now 
relative to the past 365 days. So super cheap right now. Um, on the accumulation side, this is something that I, I'm really excited about. We've seen uh, the supply held by entities with 1 million sats to 10 million sats increase, as well as the supply held by entities with the 10 million sats to one whole Bitcoin. And the 90-day the change of these is fascinating because it's just shot straight up this year. And specifically since June, since we've been down, it looks like it does during a bull market. Like there's just been such an increase in the supply held by, by these smaller entities. And like this is sort of speculation, but to me, it, it makes me think that people are beginning to understand like the, you can't be deterred by unit bias, right? Like even if you can't afford a whole Bitcoin, it's still the safest option is an investment like it's complete risk off you know in the long term like we know we know what this asset is you know traditional finance may, might not understand that yet but it seems like like the plebs are starting to really get that and we've seen before that like you know plebs don't really they buy a lot during the bull market when the number goes up because that that's the best marketing tool obviously is, is the bitcoin price but what we've seen here in this dip like this, this dip isn't as scary as the past dips because we've dipped to 20,000. Like, imagine that this magic internet money is worth 20,000 a coin and it's not going anywhere. So people seem to be understanding that and especially the smaller entities. And then when you look at the Bitcoin hodler net position change, it's been it's been solid green for the most part since last summer. And it's, it's gone up a lot the past few weeks. Um, You know, the hodlers are buying the dip like, it's sort of to be expected, but just seeing it on chain is it's a good tool for for your normie friends who say, oh, Bitcoin's just like pump and dump, like people are only in it to make money. It's like, no, like you can look on chain and see that people hold this thing for a long time and they buy it regardless of, of the price being down. Like, it's true conviction. People are are exchanging their dollars for better money. And, and that's what we see on chain. Another cool metric that I looked at this week is coin days destroyed. So this sort of measures transaction activity on the network, but it gives a higher weight to older coins. So if you moved 100 coins that you've had for 100 days, that would be 10,000 coin days destroyed. So it multiplies the day since the coin last moved times the number of coins being moved. So when you see in like 2017, a lot of people who had been holding Bitcoin for a while, they sort of, they took dollar profits and then you see a huge spike up in coin days destroyed because there was a lot of activity and a lot of the coins being moved were, were older coins. But what we see right now is coin days destroyed is, is pretty low. And, and that just shows like, again, that long-term holders are, are not moving their coins around They're They're staying put. And it also sort of tells us that transactional activity is relatively low. And that's, that's usually a good sign that we're, we're in the bottom of a bear market when transaction activity is low. And then Joe put a little piece on HODL waves, if you want to go over that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Mitch, I think you made a lot of really interesting points. Before I jump into HODL waves, I wanted to touch on one thing that you, you mentioned with the, basically the the, you know, the plebs, quote unquote, you know, accumulating positions, more Bitcoin, um, who basically these entities have less than one Bitcoin. And like you mentioned that, you know, the 90 day change of Bitcoin owned by entities who who hold less than one Bitcoin is just like soaring. Like it hasn't soared this much uh, ever. But the last time it soared this much in the 90 day period was back during the the peak of the 2017, you know, bull run when when Bitcoin was was right at twenty thousand dollars. But one thing that uh, I also kind of noticed on, on the chart was there was a, a an interesting spike basically around March 2020, like right when we had the capitulation down to quickly down to 3K and then it found some ground around 5 or 6K. But there was another like strong amount of communi- uh, of accumulation from, from plebs buying Bitcoin back then, which was interesting to me. Um, but going into to HODL ways specifically, this is one of, one of my personally favorite uh, on-chain metrics. And it basically shows the the percentage of Bitcoin in existence that were last moved within like a specific time period. So at the beginning uh, of this week, uh, a record low 6.1% of the circulating Bitcoin supply uh, moved in the last month. And I, I thought this was interesting uh, for, for two reasons. And I tweeted this out um, on, it's, uh, on, my, on my profile. But I thought this record low of, of you know, Bitcoin not moving... Uh, 
was interesting for two specific reasons. One is if you look at HODL waves, supply is, is usually only active near price tops. And I think this is because the price frenzy peaks uh, kind of coincide with, with buyers, which are, are bidding the price. They're raising their price so much that eventually old supply just decides to move and sell some coins. And so lots of coins typically shift hands at, at these parabolic tops. But the second reason is, is when supply is not moving, that, that basically means that more users are just holding. They're sitting on their hands and they're doing nothing. You know, there may be a clear lack of demand, but the supply at the moment is extremely tight. And I think that the fact that Bitcoin just saw this record low percentage of circulating supply moving in the last month basically kind of provides fur- further evidence that many of the weak hands that were, were in Bitcoin may have already been flushed out and only the strongest hands you know, might remain right now, you know, again, you know, looking at on chain specifically without macro context is, is, you know, kind of foolish and, and can, as in the past over the last year, you know, uh, led to, to potentially poor decisions, but, uh, looking at on chain specifically right now and specifically hold hold waves, um, do indicate that, you know, Bitcoin is, is in a good position jumping into to Bitcoin mining specifically. Um, hash rate is now sitting at about 221 exa hash. Uh, hash price is about eight cents. Um, this basically means that you know your ASIC will earn eight cents for every tera hash uh, per day uh, that is that's mining. So you know an S9, S19 Pro or an S19 that maybe operates at a uh, hundred tera hash is earning about eight bucks a day. Um, so that's it for for some of the key mining metrics. Other than that, uh, this week, there was actually a 9.3% increase in mining difficulty. And this was actually the largest upward difficulty adjustment since January 20th of this year. Uh, And I think this uh, upward difficulty adjustment can be attributed to to two key factors. Um, One is is miners that capitulated their rigs this past summer or this summer sold them to buyers that were you know, better capitalized and likely have access to cheaper electricity. So weak miners you know, sell more Bitcoin than strong miners. And a fair amount of ASICs uh, shifted hands during the capitulation this summer. So we, had, we saw those ASIC, ASICs move from, from the weak miners who were selling a lot to you know, more, more capitalized miners that could hold more of their Bitcoin. Um, and now they're, they're, they're finally plugged in. Uh, two is, is new ASICs, like the XPs, are, are likely starting to get shipped and, and plugged in. So that could be another reason that, that uh, difficulty soared. Um, but as you can see, if, if you look and read the newsletter, both uh, mining difficulty and the hash rate chart for hash ribbon specifically uh, it, it is clearly showing that, that you know more hash rate is coming online and, and more miners are getting plugged in. Last thing I wanted to touch on uh, that I saw was a great tweet from from Adam O from Upstream Data this this week. He posted this uh, pretty fascinating chart on Twitter that showed the massive surge in electricity prices for for Europe and Germany, and the price on the chart is clearly you know out of the ordinary. And the cost per megawatt hour uh, is one thousand uh, dollars or one thousand euros since they're basically trading at you know dollar euro equivalents right now. Um, $1,000 per megawatt hour is actually $1 per kilowatt hour. Um, this is, you know, a massive rate, even just for, for retail electricity prices. So just doing a quick, you know, fun math on, on the topic, not that anyone would actually be doing this, but, um, if you were mining Bitcoin in Germany right now and you were charged $1 per kilowatt hour and you had say 2,300 S19s plugged in, you would be paying over the next 24 hours $175,000 in energy expenses just to produce one Bitcoin. So obviously miners are, are short energy. <laughs> if, you're, if you're mining with high energy costs, uh, that's going to be a problem to mine Bitcoin profitably. Miners are also short difficulty and, and they're long Bitcoin. But the idea behind this specific topic is as energy costs like continue to rise throughout the world, whether you're in Europe or, or the U.S., you know it, it remains critical for miners to secure and lock in cheap energy contracts. Um, that's it for the mining section this week. Uh, I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to add. Yeah, I think that was great, and I I honestly think the most important thing you said was that last 
stuff talking about um, how important it is, you know, to mine with a trusted partner, um, you know, preferably in the United States with a fixed energy contract. And obviously, I don't want to, you know, act like I'm, you know, only shelling Blockware, but, you know, of course, you know, I work here and I think it's, you know, it's a great company. I think it's the best option to, to be mining Bitcoin and, and working with a trusted partner um, that has facilities in states um, with you know, relatively cheaper energy. Uh, I think that's that's super important. Um, obviously, you know, don't want to come off as you know, disingenuous, uh, but I think that if you're someone who's interested in mining or someone who's already in the mining space, um, I think it's super important uh, to keep in mind where exactly are your rigs, what are the energy costs, do you have a fixed contract, you know, some of those things. Um, and I think, you know, looking at um, Europe and, and, you know, potentially European miners is kind of been that, that biggest key recently uh, to understanding why this is, you know, potentially a disastrous issue if you're in a state like Georgia or Texas or something like that um, that's had issues um, with energy and energy costs, um, you know, versus mining with someone, you know, like Blockware in, in a state like Kentucky, for example. That's spot on, Blake. That That's a, a really good point. You know, mining is, it's great because it's one of the only things you can do to outperform just hodling Bitcoin in the long run. But there is, there's a layer of risk and there's multiple layers, right? So if you want to mine yourself, like that, that is the, the maximum ideal situation. Everyone whole mines, but you know, not everyone has like the technical know-how to do that. And most importantly, you know, the electricity costs to make it worth your while. So when you, when you go with someone like Blockware, that's, that's one layer of risk. Okay. Now we're, we're running your, your rigs for you, but we, we're in a good state. We're in Kentucky. Like that's it's it's colder it's not it doesn't have the heat issues that texas does and it's got good geopolitical um atmosphere but when you go some of these other other hosting providers you know they they don't own their own facilities so that's that's adding a, a layer of risk on top of that and when when the facility's in a different country that's that's a third layer of risk so the further you go out you know it's the less the more likely you are to to have something go wrong and I feel like block where we're in, we're in a neat spot where like we can provide, you know, cause not everyone has the, the electricity cost to be able to mine profitably and we can provide that. And it's not really a huge extra risk. And you know, we've got a, we've got a good team that pretty, pretty small account management team relatively. So, you know, we, we keep a close relationship with our clients and uh, one more thing on the mining, it just the difficulty adjustment just blows my mind every time I think about it because, you know, inefficient miners this summer, they, they're mining, unprofitably and the network just automatically moves those miners to people who are, are maximizing their resources and in rule 101 of economics is you know uh resources are scarce and how do we allocate them you know maximize or minimize the opportunity cost of allocating scarce resources and through the difficulty adjustment bitcoin automatically does that whereas with fiat money you know a lot of there's a lot of what is it called ghost companies or shadow companies they're just surviving off of cheap debt for years and that that's wasting resources they might nominally show up as as they're returning profits but in in real terms they're destroying value they're destroying more than they create and and bitcoin doesn't allow that which is just awesome and, and so fascinating that satoshi was able to to come up with this system yeah i, I agree 100 percent um i think you know I don't know if you guys have you know much more to add, but I think that's honestly a really great, great place to leave it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll add one more thing and then definitely wrap it up. But I think you guys made some, some great points. And I know this group up here, we've all actually been to a Bitcoin mine. And obviously, you know, a lot of people own Bitcoin, uh, but you've never actually seen a, a Bitcoin mine like in operation. And it's a pretty surreal experience. You know, it's, this is not just magic internet money that is you know fake and, and isn't real i mean there's you know megawatts and megawatts of energy which is you know pow- effectively energy that could power thousands and thousands of houses like this is you know we're building walls around our utxos we're building walls around our bitcoin transactions that are you know based off energy and heat so it's it's truly fascinating to, to watch see that in person and it's you know it's crazy this is a very interesting and, and wild technology yeah the network is secure just just going to our site and then like i'm trying to imagine like uh windstone the i think that's riot owns that it's the biggest site in america and i did the math earlier this week it's 40 times too small to perform a 51 percent attack so like just managing a facility of the size of windstone is already a full-time job for 
for tens, hundreds of people. So getting a facility that would be big enough to do a 51% attack, it's it's literally just impossible. Like you're not going to find a grid that can support that. You're not going to find, you know, it's, that's going to take years and years. And the hash rate otherwise is just going to keep going up. So the goalposts are being moved back. You couldn't do that quietly. So like the Bitcoin network is secure and, and that, you know, that helps me sleep at night. But uh, hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. Um, this will be up on YouTube if you missed it. And, and it's also recorded on Twitter. As soon as we get off here, we're going to send out the newsletter. So keep your eye out for a tweet on that and go read it yourself. But uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll, we do this every Friday for the most part. So, so hope to see you all again next week. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, hope everyone has a great weekend. Definitely root for the Hoosiers today. Um, but, yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. Enjoyed it.